Uh, I work for onsite.com, subscription software to landlords. We do a lot of background checks. Uh, we're also an old company. We have a very large, uh, very old legacy Java code base. Um, Apache, Tomcat, a lot of JSPs. Um, small engineering team. For most of Onsite's history, it's been a lot smaller than that. So uh, let's see. We don't obviously have an awful lot of time for infrastructure, and we don't have an awful lot of time for downtime or rewrites. So this is very pragmatic, whereby pragmatic, what I mean is we don't have an a lot of extra time to do it. So um, if you're trying to sell it to a manager who doesn't really want to do it, this is probably your approach. All right, since we have a lot of JSPs, uh, that means that we need to be able to render the JSP tags from our Ruby stuff uh, so that we get the same site look, so that we can leverage a lot of that code, so that we can avoid rewriting all of this stuff in Ruby. Um, it also means that when we write new stuff, we'd like to be able to use it from our JSPs as we continue to update. Um, I don't think I need to sell this crowd on why Rails can be a really good thing, especially compared to 10-year-old Java technology. And uh, we've got fairly complicated routing that goes through a number of tools, and it's really nice to be able to use that intact from Rails, again, instead of having to rewrite it all. So uh, that JSP thing, it turns out it's very straightforward to get a JSP tag with appropriate context, you know, the request, the servlet, the, the Java side stuff, to turn itself into a string. We have a very simple little Rails helper to do this. Uh, what you're looking at is the line in herb that renders exactly that. So in our layouts, we have a number of these to render menus at the top, to render, again, the basic site stuff, um, all the stuff we include from Java. And the other direction isn't quite as pretty, uh, but since you're doing your best to convert to Rails, you are probably also not spending as much time uh, getting the Java stuff to call your new code. You are instead trying to write as much as possible of your new code in Rails. Obviously, you could wrap this and make it prettier. If we did more of that, we'd, uh, we'd make it prettier. All right. So if your Java code is well written, it probably already looks a lot like models. Uh, you may not have as uniform a set of accessors, you may not have as uniform a set of method names, but you probably are doing validation code. You probably have a lot of stuff that's reading and writing attributes. And you'd really like to leverage that. You'd really like not to have to rewrite all that, because again, big Java code base, it could take a really long time to rewrite. Um, so, as it turns out, JRuby has really good support for calling all of that stuff and for adapting the method names to look like Ruby. So JRuby not only makes it easy to import your Java classes and to see them, it also does a very good job of converting the method names. So if you have a mixed case thing like the user ID here, um, JRuby does a fabulous job of turning that into user underscore ID so that you can call all of your method names appropriately. If you have is, you know, is something, uh, it turned in, in Java side, you can call that as something question mark from Ruby. Um, the Java stuff looks a lot like Ruby, which is beautiful. Um, so let's go to at least a small example. Uh, so this is a controller. It probably looks like the Rails controllers you're used to. Uh, the import there is different, and that's importing a Java class that we use. Um, logger call, before filter. Before filter is pretty much, yes, all of the stuff that you're used to in controllers still works. Standard stuff for Rails controllers still works. But on that update method where we call note.byid, notice that we imported a class called note, and then we call note.byid. That byid is probably uh, lowercase get, capital B-Y, ID, uh, Java side. And that's being called looking exactly like a Ruby method, passing Ruby method stuff. Um, but it's calling through to your Java all of your existing validations, all of that still works. So this actually looks a lot like Active Record. What I would recommend to, to all of you if you start doing something like this is keep the Java validation, keep the Java infrastructure, the lower levels, and your new views you can write in Rails. You don't disturb any of that. Again, if you're trying to sell this to somebody that, um, that doesn't necessarily agree with you, this is your easiest, least intrusive way to start building these new uh, views and show them that it's worth the trouble. So uh, a lot of the time, your homebrew Java stuff on your ancient, crusty legacy code doesn't work as well as you'd like. Um, there are a lot of ways around this, but sometimes the most direct way, if you're already working in Ruby, is just wrap it in Active Record. Make an Active Record wrapper for the same table. Um, nothing stops you from doing it both ways. 
few things stop you from doing it both ways. Um, so you can read the slide there. Um, validations and consistency issues. Obviously, if you trust your app server to do all of your enforcement, you've already got problems, but this will multiply your problems. Um, you have to be very careful that what you're writing is valid, and at the same time, you don't necessarily want to rewrite all of your existing Java validations, all of your existing Java logic to make sure you don't write invalid objects to the database, again, in Ruby, and then maintain both. Um, so your active record stuff is probably going to be limited to bulk lookup, to, to quick lookups, to, to simple stuff, unless you want to duplicate that logic and really switch over. Um, the other interesting thing about the way JRuby does it is that you can have both of those class objects, and if you name them the same thing, then you have to be very careful which set of methods you're testing. So it actually makes a lot of sense to name things differently enough that you can't accidentally just get the wrong method. Um, keep it in mind. We're, we're very much working on exactly how we do this at OnSite. Um, so here's an example of a, uh, an active record wrapper for something which already has a Java class. So guest card there. Uh, and you'll note at the bottom we import the Java guest card. Uh, here these do have the same name. So this would be that confusing case. Um, but you can also, you know, grab things that are not designed like Rails tables, that are not designed with Rails field names. It's very easy to wrap that. Active Record is actually pretty good for, uh, for grabbing legacy tables. And so that's what the set table name, set primary key, set sequence name, that's just wrapping a legacy table with Active Record the same way you would do it anywhere. Um, the belongs to and the after save are, yes, you get the standard active record validations, you get the standard active record everything, you can use them just like you would anywhere else, and then you import the Java one for some of that Java logic, which will be called internally. Um, what we do is we have a .j convention. Uh, for the class itself, you say guest card .j, you get the Java one, and that makes it visually obvious that what you are dealing with is the Java one. Uh, in some cases, we do the same thing with instances. Basically, if you have an active record instance and you call .j, we add an instance method that will create that Java object with that data, basically wrap up a new Java object. And then you can get all of the Java validations. You can get all of that code that you used. Um, you could think of the rule of thumb here as being don't save from active record. If you use active record as read only, as bulk lookup, there's a limit to how much trouble you can get yourself in. This approach is obviously not perfect. Um, So let's see, we've already been over point two. Uh, I've already mentioned that, you know, hard problem, this, this kind of sucks a lot of the time. Um, how good an approach this is depends a lot on how bad your code base is. Um, if you have ugly, hairy Java validations, if you have a lot of stuff that is not very well tested, that is hard to use, that you don't trust yourself to write a new implementation of, this is actually a pretty good approach because you're going to have a lot of trouble replacing that. This is, you know, it's a nasty approach, but it may be the least nasty approach that you have available. Uh, let's see, so moving from that approach, if you're calling through from Java to Ruby, which can be important in a lot of cases, uh, one of the nice things that JRuby does for you is that if you create a Java interface, you can then implement that using a Ruby object. So you include the uh, Java interface just exactly like you would a Ruby module you implement the methods, you now have a Ruby object which you can pass to Java as something implementing that interface. And that's important for the next strategy. So instead of having both a Java and a Ruby implementation for a table, for, for a type of database object, you can create the new Ruby one and you can pass that to Java. So the first method with the Java models is do it in Java, call to Java from both sides. The middle method, the ugly method is create it in Java, wrap it in Ruby, each side calls to its own. Ruby probably calls to both. The third method is build it in Ruby, wrap it in an interface. Everybody calls through to Ruby. This is obviously your best choice. It's also the one that requires rewriting. If your code is well tested, if you do have a very good idea how your stuff works and you want to uh, rewrite everything, this is far and away the prettiest. This lets you use active record. It lets you use all of the existing Ruby stuff. It lets you use what you want to use but then you have to understand well enough what your class does that you can spell out that interface and implement it correctly. Again, if your tests are good, this is your go-to your go method. Uh, so moving on to cheating shamelessly. Um, you can also basically do a Ruby eval from Java. Uh, this can be a really good thing, it can be a really bad thing. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is 
building a Ruby string in Java code, um, which is ugly and not generally a great idea, but it saves you that Java wrapper. If there is a particular interface you are going to use exactly once, this is a tolerable method to do it. But more to the point, that means that if you've got your Ruby stuff, there is always a way to get at it. It would be nice if you used a much better method than this, but there is always a way to get at it. So here is an ugly and terrible last resort. Be aware, it, it exists, it works. So just adding Rails views on top of Java models is easy, straightforward. Yeah, so just as I said at the beginning when I was first talking about Java models, if you're trying to sell this to a hostile crowd, the first thing to do is just to build new views in Rails and build it on top of your existing Java infrastructure. You want to test, touch the database? Do it through Java. That means that the people who are worried about trusting this, who are worried about, you know, well, what, what do we do if we, you know, if we can't find people, you get to say, oh, well, that's just the display layers on top. Those are easy to rewrite. And it's true. Better caching. Um, if you're doing all of your database stuff manually, there's a very, very good chance that you are not getting as good perf performance as Active Record would unless you designed those cases specifically for what you're doing. In an old code base where you've written generic, you know, database validations and database wrappers, Active Record is going to be faster than your Java stuff, even though it's running in Ruby, because it's going to do a much better job of issuing queries. It's going to do much better at looking up a lot of stuff at once. So once you get to the point of having Active Record wrappers, yell that out. Make it clear that your Ruby stuff is more efficient and faster. Um, when in doubt, measure. But the fact that it's shorter code, the first thing people are going to hold against you is it's Ruby, it must be slow. Measure it. Active Record is better at this than you are. Uh, even when you're writing Java code test with JRuby, this is another good selling point because it's pretty obvious how to do the testing code, but you will use far fewer lines in Ruby. Ruby is just better at testing Java objects. Setting stuff up with Java tends to suck. Um, mocking is limited. Uh, in JRuby, you generally can only mock when Ruby is calling. Uh, you can't monkey patch Java objects when Java sees it. But the fact that you can monkey patch even from Ruby is still useful. The fact that you can mock even from Ruby is still useful. Um, just in general, when you're writing Java code, still test it in JRuby. It just works better. Um, bugs. A couple of bugs. Occasionally, JRuby doesn't do perfect conversion. Uh, it generally does a very good job. You will not see these problems very often, and you will suspect them more often than you see them. But when in doubt, do more of your conversion Ruby side before you pass it to Java. Um, you can import all of the standard Java basic classes. You can, you know, imp you, you can uh, allocate a Java integer without any trouble. If you think that there's any chance that that's happening, Test it out, allocate the stuff in Java, pass it through as Java, and that'll tell you pretty quickly whether you're having this problem. Sometimes you will be. Um, one kind of odd thing about implementing a Java interface with a Ruby object is that JRuby doesn't know to treat it like a Java object, which means that it's implemented the methods mixed case so they look like Java methods. Uh, if you then call to it from Ruby, it won't do the automatic conversion, and so you'll be confused as to why you're treating it like a, Ru like a Java object, but it's not converting like a Java object, and it says the method doesn't exist, and you check for typos. Anyway, um, <clears throat> this will only happen when you are implementing Java interfaces with a Ruby object. Uh, it will bite you occasionally, and if you know to look for it, it's not that bad. All right. That's all the major stuff and really helpful stuff I know. Anybody got a question? Are there any interesting things around uh, Rails 3 and Active Record, Data Mapper, that kind of stuff that's uh, helping you out? Well, uh, so we're not using Rails 3 yet. Uh, we need to upgrade a couple of things before we can do that. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of changes in the code base. Uh, Active Model actually looks like it may have some really interesting things because that would allow us to wrap our Java models in something that Rails would use fairly natively. Um, <clears throat> We don't currently use a lot of form helpers because you need Active Record to do it. You know, we don't have an awful lot of Active Record, uh, and again, we don't write almost anything with Active Record. Um, but Active Model would allow that. It would allow some other cute routing tricks. Um, so yeah, that may be interesting. It's hard to tell exactly how much that'll help us, um, but it does look potentially really interesting because instead of having to do an Active Record wrapper for the same class we could wrap around our Java API, and it would all at least go through one, one single point. So potentially interesting. Don't, don't know how it'll work out yet. All right. Been uh, great to talk to everybody here. Thanks.